Hello, and welcome to Podcast.init, the podcast about Python and the people who make it great. I would like to thank everyone who has donated to the show. Your contributions help us make the show sustainable. When you're ready to launch your next project, you'll need somewhere to deploy it, so you should check out Linode at linode.com slash podcastinit and get a $20 credit to try out their fast and reliable Linux virtual servers for running your app or trying out something you hear about on the show. You can also visit the site at www.podcastinit.com to subscribe to the show, sign up for the newsletter, read the show notes, and get in touch. To help other people find this show, you can leave a review on iTunes or Google Play Music and tell your friends and coworkers and share it on social media. Your host as usual is Tobias Macy, and today I'm interviewing Justin Capos about the Update Framework, an open spec and reference implementation for mitigating attacks on software update systems. And Justin, could you please introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Justin Capos, and I'm a professor at NYU in the Tandon School of Engineering. And how did you first get introduced to Python? Uh, I was a graduate student, and I had been working for a while to try to build a package manager. This was actually in the very early days of uh, what we now call cloud computing. We kind of vServers and other kinds of virtualized environments like this had just come out. And I had this this big piece of spaghetti code that I had written in C, and it was it was messy, and it it relied on RPM, but it it did um, you know it basically let you install packages in these you know, in these virtualized uh, distributed environments in a way that saves space and had interesting security concerns, like uh, interesting security issues handled correctly. And my advisor, John Hartman, he said, you know, I came into a meeting one day and was talking to him about all the problems I was having with the implementation, the problems I was having with kind of using RPM as a tool with my C code. And he said, well, I heard about this thing, Python, and you should give it a try. And I thought, okay, well, you know, he just heard about something. He just wants me to try it out, but I guess I can, I can check it out. And I sat on, I think, a Friday and went through the tutorial. And I just really loved the language. I kind of fell in love with it right away. And so for the week and a half or so after that, I went and I actually rewrote this package manager that I've been working on and it included even all the functionality that I had been relying on RPM for. And this was you know, something that, that really made me love the language because it was so expressive and easy to use and things. So, you know, uh, as I said, this was really the first kind of cloud package manager, the first package manager at least specifically designed to take advantage of some of the things that the cloud uh, gave you. And uh, it was something that I was able to to do what had been months of work and not do as well in in a short period of time. So, and of course, personally, it was very successful for me because this ended up being my the topic of my dissertation was this package manager. Yeah, package management and dependency resolution is a challenging problem that I tackle on a fairly daily basis, given that I work in the operations space. So I'm working fairly closely with things like apt and yum and the uh, various language dependency managers. So it's interesting to hear about some of the various challenges and some of the uh, sort of theoretical aspects that, that go into them as well. Um, yeah, there's a lot more than I think people expect there. Uh, we took a look at their security early on. Really, I guess the first piece of security work I did was I had made all these design choices and, and decisions and things when I worked on you know my package manager Stork. After I had gone and done so and I needed to kind of articulate clearly how different you know, in which ways it was different from existing things, I really started to look very closely at their security. And when I did this, I was actually quite surprised that a lot of the things I'd been quite concerned about and spent a lot of time at, uh, working on were things that the the popular package managers had, uh, had just decided not to address at all. Yeah, and uh, I guess to get into that a bit, a lot of people, at least in app and uh, RPM, when they go to install a package, a lot of times you might see something about the GPG signatures for a particular package. And oftentimes people conflate the fact that GPG is involved in the overall process with the fact that there's actually some security afforded by that. So I'm wondering if you can touch briefly on why that is not necessarily the case and some of the ways that can mislead people. Sure. So one of the problems that you have is when you trust a key for a package manager, you trust it completely. And so let's say you want to go and you want to download um, a package from, let's say, the Django developers or something, and you add the, the Django developers key to your to your keychain, then that key will be trusted to validate any of the software you have. There's no kind of control about what keys are trusted in what way. And that is a is is just a huge problem because in a lot of cases the set of keys that you'll 
you'll go and you'll you'll have on on a, a system you know maybe a hundred or a couple hundred keys. So if something goes wrong with any of these, your security's gone. But what's kind of interesting is that conversely, if I go and I look and I see that everything's signed with one key, that also tends to make me much more nervous because what tends to happen, and, and this is uh, happened for some projects, is that they keep this key then in like an online server, like a build server or even on the repository itself in some cases. And then what will happen is, is that an attacker will go and break in to that server and once they've broken into that server, they can do anything they want, like uh, sign custom versions of uh, security critical packages. Uh, and this is this is something that's that's happened with quite a few um, different distributions in quite a few different scenarios. Fedora, Debian, and others have have had this happen to them. And so that leads us a bit into what you are working on with the update framework. So could you explain a bit about what that is? And heretofore, we'll probably refer to it primarily as TUF, T-U-F, for the update framework. And uh, also what the problem was that you were trying to solve when you first got involved with creating it. Sure. So the real problem that Tuff tries to solve that store and like really most, most software updaters and package managers don't even try to address is we want to make it so that even if a, an attacker goes and breaks into a server or steals a signing key, that this isn't just a kind of fatal uh, game over event where they now can, can root and compromise all your users. We want the system to tolerate key compromise in a way that means that you, know, that you have a secure way to recover from it in most situations. And the general way that, that Tuff does this is through a, a couple of different techniques. One is the idea of having something called a role. And a role um, means that a key can be used for some purposes, but not for other purposes. So you might have a key that is responsible just for telling you, has there been an update? It, you know, what is, the, what is the hash of the repository at the last time that there was an update? And it's, it's just responsible for letting you know, is there an update, is there an update? Whereas um, this would be a different key than the key you would use to actually sign a, a, a package or a piece of software and say, this is a valid copy of this specific software. And the ways, uh, so, so that's, that's one idea is this concept of roles. Uh, another concept that we have inside of Tuff is this ability for roles and, and keys that are used uh, for very sensitive things like, you know, being the root of trust in the system or signing for packages themselves. We've designed Tuff so that those keys only get used in very specialized circumstances and so it's easy uh, from an operation standpoint to keep sensitive keys offline. And in fact, some you know people that use Tuff a lot of times, certainly for the root keys, those are basically always kept offline. What I mean by that is, you know, it might be something that's on like a you know a, like a YubiKey device or something like that that you keep in a in a locked drawer or a safety deposit box or something like that. But but even for things like um, like signing packages, then you only need to use this key when you're going to do a new release. And so people will often have like mini ceremonies around uh, going and, and uh, using those keys. And one other aspect I, I want to touch on is Tuff also lets you use thresholds of keys for different operations so that you can go and you can actually do things like say, um, well, I have this project and two of my project members, uh, two of my, my four developers have to come together and say, this is a good release. Or in the case of something like the root key, you know, like five of these 10 people have to come together and use their root keys in order to sign a new root file. And this gives you a lot of resilience to uh, compromise because even if an attacker steals, you know, a developer's laptop and they left that YubiKey in it or something like that, it's not necessarily a fatal event. And is the key threshold something that is determined just at a protocol level within your implementation of Tuff in that it requires a certain number of known keys? Or is it using the key sharding approach uh, similar to what I know uh, HashiCorp's vault system does where it actually generates a key and then shards that key into multiple pieces that each, uh, each of the developers would then have one portion of? So it, it could be done either way within our system. We do support within our metadata format, which is what, you know, something that you set up when you set up your repository, you effectively say what these thresholds should be. And, you know, this key, you know, these pick two of these three keys or whatever else. But if you wanted to do something more transparent with uh, sharding and stuff, you can do that as well. 
So you mentioned the metadata for a given repository. So I'm wondering if you can talk about that some more and also how Tuff is architected overall and also what led you to choose Python for the reference implementation. Sure. So uh, when you set up a repository, you go and specify uh, sort of how trust flows uh, within the within the system. What you do is you set up a, a root file. The root file serves as the root of trust, and it has root keys, usually a threshold of them go and do signing. And then you know that that sets the keys for the other high level roles in the system, for the other top level roles in the system. And those other roles fulfill different tasks, like the timestamp uh, key. It tells you when the last time that you've updated the, the system is. The consistent snapshot role tells you basically like that there's been a consistent set of files together on the repository um, and what that consistent set of files looks like so that somebody can't pick weird old combinations of files and try to tell you that that they were all current on the repo at the same time. And then you have a, a targets role. And the targets role is actually the thing that lets you go and point to the specific files that you want to, to download and talk about like what keys should be used to assign trust to those. And the way that that's typically used is the top level targets role will go and then delegate and say, for instance, the, the Django project's uh, keys that should be trusted to sign any package that starts with Django are are this, are, you know, this is this is their information about their keys, and then under that they'll create a metadata file that will go and then say, oh, and within our project we have these three members, and uh, Alice is the only one who does packaging for Windows, so she, so every Windows thing should only be signed by Alice, and Bob and Charlie come together to do packaging for Mac and Linux, and so they should work, you know, together in in. Um, you know, and, and coordinate things this way. And and the nice thing about having this kind of metadata flow is it's, you know, the different projects get to internally manage their personnel. They get to internally manage um, how they want to handle their keys and do stuff like this. And a big repository that goes and serves this data and, you know, manages metadata, it only has to manage things at the level of, you know, this project has uh, some key assigned to it, but it doesn't have to uh, directly manipulate or do anything with that project's metadata because the project owners maintain it themselves. One one thing I'd like to also say about this is, is that if this sounds scary and hard and complicated, it's it's often harder to talk about something like, oh, you have a you know you have a file and you list people's keys in it and you say what they're supposed to, to sign. But if you look at an example, it's actually like one of these things that, you know, uh, when I give a talk about it and I, I try to show it like uh, with diagrams and a whiteboard and things, people say it sounds complicated, but then you show them the file format and you're like, wow, okay, I can totally see how I would do this. It's, uh, it's trivial. I just put my key here, right? And then this is all I need to do. Um, so if, if you're confused about any of this, then I encourage you to, to go to the updateframework.com uh, and take a look at the um, and, and take a look at the file formats and things there. Okay, and to answer your, so why do we use Python? Uh, so the main thing we wanted to accomplish with our reference implementation was for it to be a readable uh, implementation, a readable clean implementation for other people to refer to. And, you know, in my view, Python is a language, it's very widely known, it's uh, very easy for people who go and, you know, and, and uh, want to pick it up and, and take a look at it to, to do so. And to me, it reads a lot like pseudocode. So for us, um, it was kind of a no brainer to use Python. And it does seem to be readable. We have, I think, um, we have five different implementations of Tuff that have been done by outside groups. And uh, so it is apparently uh, readable enough that people could look at our code and our spec and things and figure it out. And the actual implementation of the specification, is that largely just for consuming the metadata files and ensuring that the overall workflow from the creation of the software or the package to the delivery is properly managed? You know, Tuff itself provides that role that you described where the purpose is to go and ensure that software wasn't tampered with after packaging. And the reference implementation just shows an example about how the system is supposed to work because there are a whole bunch of very subtle corner cases that people often um, have gotten wrong uh, historically that has led to insecurity. And so a big part of what we're trying to do with Tough is to show exactly how to, you know, that, that we think this is the the right way to do these things and to really open it for to the open source community, to the security community, to others. You know, if you find a problem, definitely tell us. We'd love to have people poke at us and, and uh, point out issues because there's a lot of really subtle things that 
that happen when you deal with trying to make a you know a system like this that's resilient to failures and is usable and is reasonably efficient and and so on the key signing and the chain of trust that's established by having the multiple keys for the different roles is useful for ensuring that the version of a package that you're retrieving is one that is authorized by the people who created it, but uh, it doesn't necessarily address the problem of how do you establish a proper amount of trust in the original package in the first place without having that chain of trust already present. So what are some of the mechanisms that people can use to be able to actually audit packages to ensure that they are trustworthy when they first start depending on Tuff to check that chain of trust going forward? Sure. So it's probably easiest for us to talk about this in the context of um, what what's in the PEPs, uh, the Python enhancement proposals that we uh, did actually a, a few years ago with PyPI, because um, this will kind of show how they plan to use it. But the basic way that it, it works is, is that, you know, there are targets files and these targets files are files that are kept and managed on the repository. And they go and they have signed things that says, this is Django's key. This is the key for beautiful soup. This is the key for um, for this project, for that project. And, and then what happens is that when you go and you just initially set up something like PIP, you get the, the root metadata that gets shipped with your package manager. And that root metadata tells you things like it tells you the initial um, uh, targets key that, that's on PyPI. And so from that, when you go and you retrieve those files from, from PyPI, you can go and you can get this this validated uh, list of older uh, packages, like older projects that have been around. So pretty much anything that is, you know, give or take, uh, you know, a little like a two weeks old or so is is going to be signed with a with a role that has an offline key. In the case of PyPI, so even if you go and you control the repository itself, the only thing you would be able to tamper with, and the only thing you'd be able to tamper with, this would be temporary, would be very very new. Projects projects that had just been registered in the last uh, couple weeks on uh, PyPI. And for somebody who does manage to compromise one of the keys, what are some of the potential attack vectors that uh, developers are exposed to if they don't have an auditable deployment system for their dependencies? Yeah, so if if you're not using something like uh, Tough, then you're in a situation similar to what's happened with Ruby Gems and a whole lot of other package managers and community repositories like this. And really, an attacker who breaks in and gets access to keys can do whatever they want with your users. They can sign updates that say anything they like. So yeah, so Tough is is really important unless you assume that oh, we have perfect security. It's just not possible anybody is going to ever break in and and uh, you know or ever be able to get a signing key or ever find a weakness in the algorithm that we use to uh, generate our signing key as Debian had, or, you know, be able to get into our uh, CA chain and, um, and create certificates that, that, uh, validate as correct as happened with Microsoft. You know, there's there's historically just problems over and over and over again when people don't design these systems to have the potential for revoking a key. And that is really essential here is, is that Tuff is designed to make it so that you can securely revoke a key. Yeah, and also uh, there was an interesting article that came out recently where somebody was doing some research on the potentiality of launching an attack at install time of a package in some of the more popular programming languages package managers such as RubyGems, PIP, and NPM. And a lot of them have a hook during the package installation process that will allow you to execute a script with the ostensible purpose being to use it for placing the bundled files at the appropriate locations, but it also also is a security hole in that there's not necessarily any restriction in what that installation script can do or access. So I'll add a link to that in the show notes as well for people who are interested. Yeah, it's, it's really frightening. The capabilities that you have, you know, basically, if you get to the point where you can install software uh, on their system in any way, then that, that's almost the, you know, the kind of idealized goal for attackers in any situation. Because if you really think about it, what are you trying to do if you're um, exploiting buffer overflows or you're doing, uh, you know, ROP or you're doing all these other attacks? 
you're really just trying to be able to run software on a user system. And what is nice about attacking a package manager is it's really hard to defend against uh, because it usually opens a connection outgoing that's often an encrypted connection and downloads something over it. So it's going somewhere where it's supposed to go. And so no firewall or anything is going to stop that. It's running oftentimes as root, at least with certain types of package managers after Yum uh, certainly does this frequently, although you do it a lot less frequently with something like PIP. And you know that no protection you're going to put on your system, you know, ASLR, whatever, none of that stuff is, is going to stop it because it's doing exactly what it was designed to do, which is put new code on your system to tell it to do new things. So in, in many ways, it's, it's just the ideal vector if an attacker can make it work. I think that I'm starting to understand a bit uh, from what you were describing about the PEP proposal for integration with PyPI, but one of the perennial problems with dependency management and package installation systems is the transitive dependencies that are pulled in by the primary package that you're trying to install, where you may have established trust with a given version of that one package, but how do you necessarily ensure that all of the packages that it's pulling in are trusted by the people who created the the library that you're trying to install in the first place and you know establishing a proper amount of trust but if from what you're saying there is that root key that is being used to validate everything that is in, that, that's being pulled in by your uh, primary dependency then that may go some way at least towards ensuring that you're not downloading compromised versions of those packages yeah that's a great way to put it because what ends up happening is is that the trust you have is restricted to the packages that you actually need and are actually installing in, in your system. So if you install some package and it has a dependency on something, then you do end up transitively trusting, or at least going to the repository to download the, um, you know, through its root of trust to get to that package. But a nice thing about um, our system that you wouldn't have in like a GPG-based system or other things is, is that even if, let's say somebody goes and they break in and they get the keys for the beautiful soup project, that doesn't actually help them attack users of Django or attack users of, of other software on the system. It's only beautiful soup and and um, you know, users who end up installing it that, that are at risk. So for somebody who wants to integrate the tough specification with their package management system, what are the steps necessary to achieve that integration? So one of the things that we've tried to do is make it as easy as possible for people to integrate. One way to, you know, one of our goals with Tuff was to really make it kind of a, almost like a drop-in library that you could use in a lot of different contexts. So our integration with PIP only took a few minutes to do, and um, I think we have, uh, I, I forget how many lines it was, but it's, I, I don't believe it's more than 10 lines of code we, we changed in order to it, at least get it uh, in there and working by default in the system. So you should pretty much on the client side, you just kind of plug it into your software updater and it will parse and do the correct things with all the metadata that it's been provided. If you, on the server side, you set it up on your repository and you just set things up so that, you know, you do one time setup where you set things up to be signed in the correct way by the appropriate roles. And then now when you actually go to produce a package or do something like this, then you'll actually use your key uh, to go in and do these signatures. So it really doesn't change the workflow that people do on either the client or the server side. Um, it just makes them use, you know, on the server side, you use keys in places where you maybe should have been using keys, but you weren't really using keys. And on the client side, your clients never, they don't know that they have Tuff installed in their software updater unless there's an attack. And then Tuff goes and, and tells them, hey, this, you know, something really fishy is going on here and, and helps to keep them safe. And for the metadata files that are included with the projects, so for example, with a uh, Python wheel or Python egg that gets uploaded to PyPI, when somebody does go to install it using pip, I guess if you could just describe a bit about the installation process that's involved there that ensures that the metadata is parsed before any of the actual install hooks are executed so that you don't accidentally execute some potentially compromised code. Sure. So anytime you're you're going and you're downloading uh, and installing something with a package manager or a software updater that uses Tuff, what it'll do is it'll always check the validity of 
the target, you know, whether this is a package or just like a normal zip file or a tarball or a wheel or whatever, it'll check that validity before it goes and provides that to the software updater or package manager. So in fact, Tuff will do the download for, you know, on its behalf, because there's actually some attacks that relate to, you know, how you uh, get information from the network and what you do with that information. Both Apt and, and Yum, for instance, had problems that I found back in uh, 2000 and seven, uh, along with a student of mine, Justin Samuel, um, we found that if you just fed them a, an endless stream of bytes, that they would both crash and have problems. Apt would would fill all memory on the system, and of course, you know this would this would cause your your server, whatever it was, to kind of lock up and, and stop responding very well. And on Yum, it would actually fill the disk and then Yum would crash and it wouldn't even print out an error message or anything like that. So even simple attacks like that, you know, our goal with Tough is to be this really comprehensive, you know, thing that you just kind of drop in and then you don't really have to worry about the security of your updater because we've really taken care of it for you. And what are some of the projects that are already using Tough in their dependency management systems? Sure. So it's uh, it's used in a, a few different projects uh, now. It's used by Docker. Um, so if you go and you install things through Docker Hub, then you're using something called Notary, which it integrates top. And it's also used in uh, Flynn and inside of Leap. So we've had some uptake in kind of the container management space. And we've also had some in more recently, uh, we've been working with the automotive industry and we've just uh, reached the point where we have what's effectively an automotive version of Tough uh, called Uptane that you can actually now go and buy from an automotive uh, vendor, uh, like a supplier, uh, the, the people who make parts for the for the OEMs. And we have about five other vendors that are currently in the in the process of integrating and implementing Uptane into some of their products. And so um, we're hopeful that uh, looking ahead that uh, we'll be able to solve this problem in a lot of uh, different contexts. Yeah, given the increased usage of software systems and infotainment systems in modern automobiles, I can definitely see how having something like Tough put in place would be immensely valuable, especially in light of a lot of the attacks that have had successful reference implementations done. For instance, the Jeep system where the uh, attackers were able to completely lock up the brakes and take full control of the vehicle while it was on the highway and uh, other things like that, where as our vehicles become more connected, they become increasingly more vulnerable to people who are uh, not necessarily acting in the best interests of the people behind the wheel. Yes, it's a very scary situation now because of the lack of security that exists in many of these um, in, in many of these devices in many of these environments. Uh, one thing I will say that's I think very positive about the automotive industry is that they have really started to, to really try to take notice and do what they can to to secure these systems. And so we've been working with them a lot on the Subtain project. We've been working with, I, you know, I, I'm not supposed to name names of individual companies and things, but we've had a participation from you know, 30 or so uh, different organizations when we've had these meetings, including major OEMs, uh, major suppliers, even folks from um, like government agencies that do regulatory things around uh, vehicles and stuff like this. And and uh, they've been very receptive so far. Um, and I'd like to encourage anybody that is potentially interested in helping vehicular security and uh, to go and take a look at our specification uh, for Uptain, uh, U-P-T-A-N-E. And uh, if you find any things that you think are security problems with it or any other limitations or issues, we'd love to have your feedback because just like with things like Tough, we we really you know appreciate and, and get a lot of value from the security review that people in the community have given to us. Yeah, it's always great when something like this is able to cross over from a academic research project into something that is immensely practical in industry as well. So it's uh, definitely great to hear about this. Yes, I'm. I'm very focused on that, and really feel that you know if you're if you're going to do if you're in academia, you should be trying to do things that are going to be for the better of humanity. Yeah. So within my lab, we're really focused on trying to have practical impact across a whole bunch of different domains. So really, anything we build, we try to deploy in practice in in large. Uh, software projects uh, whenever and wherever we can. We, you know, recently we fixed um, some design flaws in the way Git was doing signing. And, uh, you know, we've 
been active in in trying to to improve security of, and fix bugs in in Python and you know a lot of other contexts in a, a, apart from the the tough things. So um, you know if anyone listening is is uh, potentially interested in you know coming in and uh, you know working with us, I'd I'd love to hear from you. Absolutely. I'll have you send me the preferred contact information for anybody who does want to follow up with you for any of that. So Tough is great for once you've already got a package built and you're working on distributing it and you want to ensure that chain of trust in the distribution and updating of the final product. But how? what are some of the ways that you can mitigate some of the other attack vectors in the initial creation and development of a project before it gets to packaging? Yeah, so one of the things that you'll hear a lot about is reproducible builds. This gets promoted a lot. Uh, Mike Perry with the Tor project had really did a, a great job of bringing this to people's attention. And now you see a lot of major like Linux distributions like Debian, for instance, that are going and um, you can, the vast uh, majority of their packages do have reproducible builds working for them. But that's really only one part of the, the puzzle here. Um, you also have to have a bunch of other things that uh, all kind of go your way and work correctly. Like um, you have to have your do signing within your version control systems and make sure that the things that you sign and the way that you sign them actually give you meaningful security properties, which um, unfortunately isn't isn't as straightforward as as uh, you might think. Um, and then attackers from have also gone and tampered with things in the middle, you know, throughout the process as software moves, you know, from version control system through test processes into build systems to you know continuous integration systems and so on. So one of the things that we're, we're working on now is to try to have like a kind of whole system all the way from the moment the, the code is written by the developer, all the way through the VCS code review, all the style checking, you know, all the rest of the process up to the point when it reaches the user. We want to do verification and validation to ensure that they're, the software you're getting is authentic, is what your developers meant to build, and so on. And we're still kind of in a little bit of stealth mode about this, but I will tease it for your viewers. Uh, the project's name is is uh, in uh, Toto, and if you're interested in finding out more about it, then you know you can check the link on my website and click on my projects and and see things about it there. And we'd be happy to provide anybody with more information when we uh, publicly release. Yeah, that definitely sounds like an interesting approach and something that's definitely needed, particularly as software systems continue to be increasingly critical in everybody's day-to-day -day lives. So are there any other subjects that we should touch on? I don't think so. There's nothing I can think of. Are you looking for any particular types of contributions from people for the tough framework or the specification? You know, the honestly, the things that would be the most useful is getting people to say, why isn't tough in warehouse? <laughs> if they want to do kind of like, uh, you know, I, I know it's on it's on people's radars, but more people who kind of ask that question, I think the the bigger the dot is on the radar. The other things, you know, if people point out, you know, if there are security issues that people see, we haven't really had very many of them, although we've had a lot of reviews. But if you if someone does find a security issue, especially in Uptain, which is, I guess, newer and, and has more has changes to Tough that would make it perhaps more likely that they would find something. Um, of course, we'd love to have that. Um, we're always encouraging people who are interested in using it in their domain to go ahead and integrate it. You know, you don't have to use our implementation. You're welcome to, but other people have um, pretty quickly been able to whip up their own tough compliant implementation. So we'd be happy to uh, work with you or discuss uh, any issues you might run into with that as well. And for people who are building their own implementations, is there some form of test suite to ensure that it's properly compliant with the specification? Yes, um, you should be able to go and take and run uh, pretty much all the, or many at least, of the tough tests um, because they really deal with manipulating the uh, metadata files and things of that sort. So you should, for the most part, be able to go and do it as long as you uh, use the same like JSON formats and other things that we did. And given the fact that Tough is not yet integrated into PyPI or the warehouse project, is it possible for people to start using it in a PyPI mirror? Oh, yes, you certainly could do this. Um, you could even start to sign Tough metadata for your projects today. Uh, there's certainly nothing that would stop you from doing it. It's just that, unfortunately, um, currently PyPI isn't going to be going and sort of providing the key information 
uh, you know, the information about what your project key is uh, to your users automatically um, so that your instance of PIP or whatever that would consume this information would validate it. So you can certainly add the metadata now. It's just unfortunate that it won't be able to be to be used yet. And do you know if there are any plans on inc- incorporating that into the Conda system as well? Um, yeah, there. we've had some really great discussions with the Conda folks. Um, we've had actually great discussions with a lot of different folks, you know, with folks in the Ruby community. We've been working a lot recently with the CoreOS folks, uh, looking at Haskell and OPAM and and uh, just a wide variety of different communities that are, that are interested in this. So if you're a member of one of these communities or, uh, and are able to, you know, give a little bit of time, then you can perhaps help to make a, a big difference by helping them to be secure so that if there is an incident, it doesn't impact their users in a negative way. All right. Well, with that, I will move us into the picks. Like I said, I'll have you send your preferred contact information for anybody who wants to follow you and keep get in touch, or if they want to get involved with the work that your lab is doing. And so for my first pick today, I'm going to choose the Enchanted Forest Chronicles, which are a series of four books that are sort of targeted young adults that I recently reread with my son, and they're just very humorously put together. They are very tongue-in-cheek with a lot of sort of the fairy tale and fantasy see icons and uh there's there's a lot of good humor in them there's a they're a fun storyline and so i definitely recommend checking them out for anybody of any age really and with that i'll pass it to you do you have any picks for us today justin i'd encourage you if you haven't ever had hand pulled noodles which is a interesting uh, uh chinese thing where they they you know they hand roll out the noodles and they make them into your soup. Um, I'd encourage you to try it. If you're in New York, then there's Lamb Joe, which is uh, quite a good place in Manhattan's Chinatown. But you can really, anywhere that makes them, I, I've never had a bowl of them and been disappointed. All right. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to tell me more about the update framework. It's definitely interesting work and important work, and I look forward to seeing it more tightly integrated in all of the different software systems that I use. So I appreciate it, and uh, I'm sure the listeners will enjoy hearing more about it as well. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.